We have Derek Thomas speaking next. He's a senior information security consultant at eCentire. So give it up. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Oh, we got a packed room coming out after lunch. I'm impressed. Hopefully, we can keep you awake here. So, uh, my name is Derek Thomas. We're going to be talking about uh, just security baselines, kind of a fundamental uh, application of uh, statistics and analysis for logs and determining upper and lower thresholds on your on your log data. Look kind of for funny stuff. So, start off with who am I? Derek Thomas uh, on Twitter. I'm D Tom. Uh, that's with a zero. So, if you want to uh, say hi anytime. Um, you know, I'm, I'm basically a family guy. I'm a security consultant with East Entire. Uh, my domain knowledge has been in uh, log management SIM. So for almost my entire uh, security uh, career, I've been doing SIM implementations with uh, pre-sales, post-sales, um, ongoing services, things like that, uh, with, with several, different, uh, several different vendors. Uh, I've also done vulnerability management, and I kind of, uh, from a theoretical standpoint, uh, try to try to stay up with uh, different pen testing techniques. I mean, I think if you're going to be a good uh, a blue team, or you got to understand red team. If you're going to be a good red team, you got to understand blue team. So I think both of those are kind of critical. So uh, I'm a lover of logs. I've probably, if you know me, I've probably bored you to death on numerous occasions with, uh, you know, talking about uh, Windows security logs and uh, uh, network hardware logs. So. Uh, I primarily with logs, I focus on threat detection. Um, I, like, I, like, I like logs because they tell you everything that's going on in the environment. You can see everything a user does, um, and that's really the definitive uh, activity for, for that user. So once there's post, once an exploits or once there's been a compromise, that's what you're going to be going to. Um, and I consider myself an armchair data analyst, so I'm trying out my skills. I think that's going to be critical. If you're in the same field with log management and SIM, you're going to need to be able to uh, kind of start applying advanced um, uh, analysis to the log data. We're getting to a point where there's ridiculous quantities of log data. I think in my day-to-day -day life, I've got over a petabyte of uh, compressed logs to work with across all our clients. So um, it's, it's kind of impressive to me. So day-to-day. Uh, -day, I manage uh, log management sensors, so I'm in the uh, Linux command line interface, uh, Python. Uh, somehow I got miyagi into uh, learning SQL, so I never touch SQL, but uh, become pretty decent at uh, querying and uh, extracting data. And I've been studying R on my own. I think that's going to be one of the uh, a pretty good language to to do um, this type of analysis, and most of the things you need is, are built in. Uh, I volunteer with ultimatewindowsecurity.org, so if you're familiar, if you've ever looked for Windows events, that's probably the first thing that comes up. There's tons of great content for uh, Windows logging. Active in the Michigan InfoSec community, I see some MySec people out here, so let's give a, a shout out to, to MySec. But, um, and uh, in my previous life, I was a blackjack dealer, so I kind of came home here. So if you want to talk about card counting or anything, that's kind of a fun fact afterwards. So word of caution. Uh, I heard Ken Weston say he's not a data scientist. I heard a couple of people say that, so I'm definitely not. I've been trying to up my game and, and apply uh, these concepts to log data. Um, and this presentation is kind of the application of my research into uh, the data that I work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and their experiences have been pretty, pretty good so far. Uh, clients will often ask us, you know, hey, I want to see weird stuff happen. And if you're, if you're like me, if you're generating use cases, you're like, well, what does that mean? You know, when you're generating use cases, you need clear defined uh, uh, events and alerts that you want. So this is one way that you can hopefully answer that question. Um, so we're going to be focused on just obtaining kind of practical results. You can apply these concepts in Excel if you want, uh, Python or R or SQL, whatever you have at your disposal. You should be able to uh, apply these concepts. Uh, covering the agenda, I'm going to talk about um, why I'm giving this presentation, what I'm hoping you get out of this presentation. Uh, why I like internal log data. I see a lot of uh, external data, web data, DNS data, but I haven't really seen much in uh, operating system. Why determining normal is uh, important, what a baseline is, getting data and exploring it, um, investigating it, and then finally kind of creating the thresholds, running through a use case methodology, and, uh, and we'll probably go for, through two different use cases, and then I'll, I'll follow up with some resources and references. So I feel that log data is highly underutilized um, when I talk to people. Um, there's not that many I find in that are in uh, security mining. How many people here operate uh, or use log data on a day-to-day -day basis? So I, I'm in good company here. It's not normal. I don't normally find that at, uh, at other conferences. So I like to see that. But um, I find that there's a little, there's very little defined approach to using log data. Like you know, uh, when I'm doing implementations for SIM in my previous life, 
you would implement it, and then you know the clients say, now what? Well, you got to define what you want. You got to figure out what's valuable to the company. Um, so I learned way too much the hard way, and so hopefully this will be one of those things I can help uh, you guys with. Um, and the main reason is when I was looking through best practices in the in the very beginning, everything says look for normal activity, look for trending, but no, nothing ever says how to do that. Have you, has anybody ever seen really how to determine a trend? You know, really it's visualize it and say, look for this spike. But sometimes that spike is normal and it may not be uh, something you need to investigate. So I find there's little coverage um, with security data analysis uh, and pertaining to Windows logs and, and network data. So I'm hoping to kind of cover that gap um, or that perceived gap. So I'm trying to provide uh, practical strategies. So like I said, if somebody implements this in Excel, I'm going to consider it a success because I think that's awesome. Um, I do everything in R or SQL, um, but hopefully you can do it in anything that you're familiar with. Um, so we're going to cover methods that are easy to understand and describe. Um, that's really the goal. I mean, it's going to be, this is straightforward, but you need to be able to describe this to the stakeholders in your organization and say, why is this important and what's going on? Um, there's some really cool stuff with deep learning, but you know, to describe that to clients or management, how, you know, how are you going to do that? There's a lot, sometimes things are perceived as a black box, so hopefully this is one way that you can easily illustrate kind of uh, uh, anomaly detection techniques. So like I said, this can be implemented in Excel, Python, R, SQL, etc. cetera. Uh, so kind of cover this. I see, a, I see a lot of content on DNS logs, firewall logs, NetFlow, web logs. Um, I don't see on, on Windows logs. Windows tells you everything that's going on in your environment and everything a, a user has done. So I think that it's very valuable. Uh, so why is uh, the importance of normal? Have you ever been, has anybody here been asked to, you know, uh, determine what's normal or try to trend data or create baselines? So yeah, if you Google log management best practices, everything says that. So hopefully this will be a tool for that. Um, so beyond just kind of like alerting on thresholds, there's also a tool for proactive investigation or uh, some people call it hunting. So uh, I've seen that frequently looking for deviations in traffic in an unknown data set. So that you'll be able to use this to go back in time and look if anything abnormal happened during that time. Um, aids in investigation. So from time to time I've been asked and said, Derek, you know, I just looked at this report. There's 1,700 authentication failures. Um, please investigate that. Well, the first thing I do to say, is that normal? Every single day there could be 1,700 or authentication failures, and yet the users aren't aware. So um, this is an, a tool that you say, well, yeah, this happens every day. On average, it happens this amount of time, and it'll, it'll uh, increase or decrease by X amount uh, based on the deviations. So, and it can also help you understand your environment. So when I, if you got into a new environment, you could apply these techniques to kind of see um, what's going on. So as security professionals, and specifically as security monitoring professionals, uh, I have had very little um, ability to affect change in terms of like policies and things like that. So uh, you can understand, well, it might be normal for users to RDP into all your servers, right? It may not be best practice, but it happens and I can't change that. So this is one way to monitor that type of activity. So we're talking about baselines. So like I said, best practices always state look for trends and abnormal activity. So here's an example of just uh, aggregated Windows event count per hour, right? You see a significant spike at six o'clock. But, you know, is that a trend? You know, is this even abnormal? Um, and really, what is normal? So those are the things we're gonna tackle. So um, looking at these, you can see that at first you might seem like there's a significant spike and something's going on, it's bad. But as you go on, you see that's happening every day. So either that's normal activity or you've been pwned and this has been going on for a very long time. So what is a baseline? I kind of give a fundamental definition of just, it's a measure of the normalness of some set of data, right? Um, I try not to get too technical with these. Um, down here is a, a reference to, I pulled this from a book called uh, Logging and Log Management by probably the godfather of security monitoring, uh, Anton Chavakin. So that's a great book. Um, it's kind of hard to get through. Log management's not the most electrifying thing to read through, but uh, it's definitely valuable in my opinion. So we're going to talk about uh, baselining and um, in particular baselining uh, events that kind of follow a normal distribution. Um, what, what I found is that a lot of the data that we look at will be approximately normal. And uh, if you're not familiar, um, the normal distribution really just means that on average, activity will occur uh, near the average. And as you go farther out, either up above or below that account, um, the probability of that occurring will, will be less and less. Um, and if it follows a normal distribu distribution, you can see that uh, 
tip with 68% of the time, it'll fall within one deviation above or below the mean, and 95% of the time, one or two standard deviations above or below the mean, and then 99.7, three, uh, give or take. So we're gonna be using this data to create our thresholds after we've determined that the data is uh, approximately normal. So what types of things can you baseline? Uh, really, anything that occurs uh, on average, and we'll deviate you know, above or below the average um, kind of equally. We gotta, it's, uh, we gotta have good symmetry. So things like event rates, which we'll talk about, authentication failures, maybe bytes transferred in a VPN session um, could be good candidates. Uh, the first question I always get is, what about non-normally distributed data? Well, there's other techniques for uh, analyzing that. I'll probably show a tool at the end called uh, Twitter's anomaly detection um, for non-parametric data, but uh, we're gonna focus on normally distributed data and creating thresholds and analyzing that. <coughs> so we're gonna start with uh, the Windows event rate. So Windows event rates, um, it's really exactly what it says. The quantity of events that are coming in. So it's often measured in events per second. Uh, we, we aggregate events every five minutes, could be events per hour, per day, uh, whatever you want. So basically events, uh, event rates in your log management system, it's probably not going to uh, catch an APT, right? Like an APT is not going to be generating a million events that don't normally occur. They're going to try to uh, try to create the, as little as possible to kind of fall in with normal traffic. But it's, I still think it's extremely valuable for um, things like uh, determining log sources that have failed, uh, determining scripts that have uh, gone haywire, like maybe, you, maybe the password's changed on a script on, a, on an admin's desktop. Um, maybe there's operational issues. Uh, you can't catch an APT if you're not logging, and if, you're, if your uh, agent on the domain controller failed, well, and you don't know it, that could be a significant problem once that data starts to roll over. Um, and also, you may, not, you may think you're logging, but you're not due to audit configuration. So, um, maybe you don't even produce logs for login failures. So here's an example. Um, you know, some people may or may not be familiar with Windows. This is a standard Windows log. Uh, you can see that um, there's a little diagram. You know, we transmit data typically through syslog. Windows has uh, Windows event forwarding. Uh, there's many ways to get the data. So, but most log management systems, SIM systems, can uh, will measure the events per second because they use that data to determine uh, are we overloading the system. They usually have some sort of specification to say, you know, we can handle 10,000 events in a second, or we can handle three million events um, surges and things like that. Um, so obtaining this data is probably the most difficult thing I talk about. Um, I think in data science and data analysis in general, I think getting and uh, cleaning the data is probably the most difficult uh, from what I'm told. But like I said, most systems will have that. Um, here's an example. This is ELK measuring events per second. This is a SIM right here measuring events per second. And if you don't have either of these systems, uh, you could look at a, a custom uh, application using a graph, uh, a metric server. So StatsD from Etsy as a way like uh, Logstash can output to StatsD. So if you can start counting your events uh, and, and visualizing it and analyzing them. So avail data available to me, available to me was aggregated uh, into five minute periods. So um, I extracted that data, pre-processed it in, pro in Postgres. Um, and I, was, I wasn't sure what I was looking for. So you see really the, day, really the data started off with just a timestamp, a Windows count and a syslog count. Um, but I extracted the day of the year, the day of the week, the hour of the day, because I'm not sure uh, as we started to explore the data what we're going to be looking at. Are we going to be comparing specific hours of weekdays? Are we going to be carrying, comparing full days against you know, all Mondays? Are we going to be comparing weekdays to other weekdays? So those are things that we're going to find out. But basically the data is all just a comma separated format with uh, integer quantities for event rates. So before you start, you always ask some questions. Um, and for, especially for these baseline, you're going to be asking, is this data approximately normal? Um, that's going to be the big one for, de for developing statistically relevant thresholds. You can always just calculate standard deviations and add it and subtract it, but it may not be statistically relevant um, as we'll talk about. So if the data is not normal, can you make it normal? So can you subset the data? Like uh, with this, I'm gonna assume that weekdays and weekends, weekends you're probably gonna get far less data. So that would skew your data and you may have to model those separately. Um, and are there anomalies within the data set? So once you look at the data, is there extreme anomalies that you're gonna have to deal with? And we'll talk about uh, how, to do, how to do that. So the first thing I did was visualize the data. Um, these are uh, 
the quantity of events that occur per day. So you, you see that there's kind of a, uh, you know, like a, most of the data occurs right here. Then you see uh, two sequential days far below. So first thing I think, those are weekends, right? Because you're gonna say typically the uh, traffic could be lower because there's not many people. It's gonna be automated processes always generating events, so there'll always be events. Um, so those are a few things that I immediately look at. So the data was probably skewed due to weekends. There appear to be several outliers. So down here, this one's extreme. Um, and we'll talk about this one in a minute. But then also when I look at these, are there any other uh, patterns that you see here that might be considered kind of a local outlier? Does anybody see it? Yeah, right here. So you look at that and you say, okay, there's two sequential, but here there's three. So let's talk, well, that's something we need to look at. And that's the first thing that I uh, queued up to when I was looking at this data set. Um, but when I look at the weekdays, so I think these are weekdays, the data looks to be, you know, based on this graph, could be normally distributed. You see it usually happens around this. Sometimes Mondays are lower, sometimes they're higher, sometimes Tuesday's way high, um, and sometimes it's lower. So um, there seems to be a decent distribution above and below. Could your first cluster be a holiday weekend? That's a great point, and you're absolutely right. So that, that right there is actually Good Friday. So it's a stat holiday on that one. So, um, so I'm gonna take a look at the, and now I'm gonna color code the weekend. So now we definitely know that this is uh, the weekend. So this is Saturday and Sunday. This is a Friday. So I took a look and that day is the uh, 85th day of the year. So I took a look and that's Good Friday. And they happen to have a stat holiday for Good Friday. So um, this is far lower than what we would normally experience. This down here is something that needs to be investigated. What's going on here? This is what we're gonna be looking for. We wanna see when things like this happen. And what that was was audit configuration. So they didn't have the proper audit configurations enabled. So they weren't getting anywhere near the log data that we needed to be getting. Um, and once they enabled that, it, uh, it turned on. And they were trying to get this done before Good Friday, I think. So there's two possible outliers. Um, we need to figure out how we're gonna handle them. Um, I find that within the data science community and statistics community, handling outliers seems to be kind of a really uh, tough debate, How, you know, do you get rid of it, do you keep it, but um, I think that in these cases we want to get rid of them, especially this, because this is not normal traffic, so we don't want to use this to base our baselines off of. It's not like this was a naturally occurring because um, there's a big project and everybody's working and that's generating a lot more events. It was just strictly due to a technical deficiency. And then this is a holiday, so I definitely, when you're doing something like this, take a look and say, do we even want to include stat holidays? Okay, because those are going to be lower. Um, that's going to be a choice that's up to you. And really the worst case scenario is that this um, would be an alert that day. Do you have people that would even uh, respond to an alert on a stat holiday? If no, I would definitely get rid of it. Um, there's really three different me uh, methods uh, to deal with outliers. So um, trim, uh, excluding it, um, you could, which is... Uh, Trimming, there's winds arising, which is replacement. So you could take the average Friday and just replace that value with the average Friday. Um, you could also just keep it. So if it's a naturally occurring outlier, I would definitely keep it. Like it all, you just really have a lot of people working hard and doing a lot of administrative activity. That's naturally occurring and that should probably stay within the data set. Uh, so we're still kind of going through the exploratory data. We think this is, could be a naturally, or this could be uh, normally distributed. It's impossible to tell from this graph alone. So we'll take a look. Um, we're gonna look at the histogram. So the histogram will take, uh, will bin the data into groups and, and, and tell you the frequencies. So in a normally distributed data, you're gonna see some uh, symmetry around the median. But here you totally see the, um, the uh, skewed data due to the weekends. So this is including the weekends. So after removing the weekends, we see a little bit better data. There's a little bit better symmetry, but it's still that Good Friday outlier. Again, I'm gonna remove that take a look. Now we see the data looks much better. We still think it could be skewed here, but again, we're only looking at about uh, 30 data points. So this is a sample. Um, the data is never going to be perfectly distributed. We need to find out whether it's accept uh, acceptable for our analysis. Uh, so there's a couple, I'm going to talk about a couple of techniques for looking at uh, um, the data and determining if it's normally distributed. So the first one's called a, a QQ plot. Basically that maps the, the the data versus the theoretical quantiles. And the only thing that I need to know is, is this data following this line? If it's close to this line, it has a better chance of being normally distributed. Um, we do see on this data, that there's a few po points where it starts to stray off. 
So this looks like it's pretty good. I have a better feeling that this is normally distributed, but I'm not, still not totally positive. You'll never be totally positive. We're just trying to determine if this is approximately normal so that we can create upper and lower thresholds um, using the statistics of uh, normal distributions. So the next thing I did is I said, well, what does a, what does a randomly uh, uh, generated normal distribution look like on a QQ plot? So I, I took the mean of the data set, I took the standard deviation, and I pumped it into uh, R norm on using R and generated this data randomly. So randomly, um, absolutely taken from a normal distribution, it looks like this. You see it deviates a little bit, so this makes me feel a little bit better about the data. You see that there are a few points that are straying from the line, um, there's still only 30 data points. Um, we see similar deviations. So I feel better that this is normally distributed. And you can see uh, comparing them directly. But this is still a visual interpretation. Um, it, it's up to your judgment. And a lot of this will be. Um, much like outlier detection, there's no, um, with outlier detection, there's no specific guidelines for determining what exactly is an outlier and how to handle it. But uh, finally, we're going to take a look at another test. Uh, this is the Shapiro-Wilkes test. So the Shapiro-Wilkes test is available in R, uh, but you can also, I've seen it done in Excel. It's, done in, it's available in multiple uh, packages. So um, what this does is really you just feed it your list of quantities. So that was the list of all the events through the, through the data set that we had. Uh, feed it into the function Shapiro.test, and it outputs a p-value. And what that p-value tells you is that if this is over 0 0.05, there's a possibility that this was taken from a normally distributed data set. And the higher this value, the better that possibility is. If it's below 0.05, we would have to uh, exclude it from being normally distributed. So we've determined that the data appears approximately normal. We're going to be going through the exercise of baselining weekday non-holidays. Um, you're going to have to, to uh, analyze the uh, weekend data separately. You go through the similar methods, um, but you'd have far less data because you'd have to use you know, 30, 15 weeks worth of data to, to collect that. So the thresholds are going to be calculated to determine surges and dips in the value. So we're going to use this data um, to create the thresholds. So here I've rescaled the data. You see this red line is the median. Um, this is the average value. You can kind of see above is about the same amount of events as below it. Um, it looks pretty evenly distributed. You see, to me, it looks like there's more in this band. And as you go farther out, there's less. Um, so we're going to take a look at calculating the deviation in this data. Um, kind of basic statistics, the standard deviation measures the spread. Um, so here I have lines for one standard deviation, two standard deviations. And what we see is that 64% of the data is within one standard deviation, 97% is within two. Um, and I've provided a couple examples of how you can uh, calculate this. So in R, uh, SQL, Excel, pretty easy. It's, it's, a, it's a base uh, mathematical function. So going back to our uh, uh, normal curve here, we see that 68% um, of the data should be within one standard deviation. Our data's got 64, so we're pretty close. And this is a, you've got to keep in mind this is a sample uh, from real data. We see 97% is within two standard deviations. That's pretty close to our 95% uh, thresholds. Um, so I think we're pretty good. We're pretty close to the, what they call this the three sigma rule um, that you know, this chart illustrates the three sigma rule, which is a, kind of a base property of normal distributions. So for me, creating thresholds, if you, two standard deviations works pretty well for those thresholds. And you can say that 95% of the time, they should fall within that uh, threshold. And after that, um, that would be somewhat anomalous. You could use three standard deviations, again, depending on your use case. So for the example of uh, events per second, usually when there's significant uh, deviations, it's major, like audit configurations have stopped. Network configurations are blocking syslog. Those are things that will cause significant drops. So depending on the use case, you might want to use two, maybe three uh, standard deviations. Uh, so we're going to talk about baselines as a use case. I think this was kind of a, a fundamental topic through all the ground truth tracks, too. I hear a lot of people talking about use cases. When it comes to uh, security monitoring, I feel probably one of the best things you can do is def create well-defined use cases. I hear a lot of complaints, and the answer to most of those complaints with, uh, with any sim that anybody has ever used, I think, could be solved with, uh, with a well-defined use case. Um, so we're, we're going to walk through another baseline example. Uh, I pulled this example from threathunting.net. So if you're familiar with uh, threat hunting, a couple of the people that are very well known have created a GitHub repository for successful hunts that they use. Um, and one of these hunts utilizes Windows logon events um, 
for detecting lateral movements and RDP external access. So that's what we're going to talk about as a, as a pretty good security relevant example. Um, also, what I like about uh, threathunting.net is some of the techniques rely on baselining and outlier detection. So both are, um, are very applicable to what we're doing right now. So if you're not familiar with RDP, it stands for Remote Desktop uh, Protocol. So if you want to log in from computer A to computer B and have a, 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 a GUI uh, interface to that computer, you can use RDP. Um, that produces an event. It's a 4624 Windows event ID of type 10. Um, the type 10 in, uh, indicates interactive logon or remote interactive logon. Um, and that's what we're going to be using for collecting this data. So we're going to baseline RDP access um, within the environment. Um, RDP access could be used for administration, could be uh, attacker movement, like I said, lateral movement, um, but it could be excessive connections from a new administrator. Um, RDP should not be necessary for most uh, administration activities, from my knowledge, but um, I find that it is often used for that. So this is a good use case because administrators will use it, but it may not be maliciously. So we'll cover kind of the use case primer. Um, this, applying this use case to not just baseline to anything you do within log management, I think is critical. So I've pulled this from a resource called InfoSec Nirvana. Um, they kind of outline a, a, good, um, a good methodology. Um, there's a great, uh, it was, I think it was a stable talk at DerbyCon uh, last year or two years ago. Um, it's pretty quick, 30 minutes. This is a very in-depth, intense uh, use case walkthrough. So it provides documentation, tracking use cases as they go on and measuring new use cases as you create them. Um, use cases follow, uh, uh, I think it's an eight step kind of program. So we start off with uh, developing the requirements of the use case, um, defining the scope. So what's this use case going to apply to? Your whole environment, a remote office, specific assets, things like that. Then what event sources are going to be needed for the uh, use case and do we have that data? We're going to validate that the use case is feasible. So in our case, we're going to look at uh, determining whether the data is normal, um, what logic we're going to use for uh, generating the outputs. So you know, when do we send you an email? When do we send you a report? When do we create a dashboard event, et cetera? And then we're going to go through implementation and testing, um, the actual response to the alert. So you know, one of the biggest things I get is, OK, I see these alerts in the dashboard, Derek, but what do I do now? So defining that is critical, and then ongoing maintenance. The first step is defining the requirements. Um, so requirements are really a high level. Why are we doing this? So we're either doing this to enhance security. Um, another one might be compliance or regulatory. Or maybe it's a business use case of enabling availability so that a business process can, uh, can occur. So for me, RDP access probably falls into security and compliance. Um, you know, PCI requires uh, monitoring authentication, remote access to systems. Um, and it's also just a good, uh, a good housekeeping for, for monitoring remote access within your environment. So defining the scope. The scope defines the physical or logical group. So what's, the, what's this use case going to apply to is really what you're asking yourself. In our case, it's everything. Um, and, and that'll probably be a lot of cases. When you look for people clearing logs, you're not just, you don't just care about a specific uh, office. Um, but you may be setting alerts to different people. And in that case, you would have a, a more granular um, scope for that. So what event sources are needed? I've already covered this. 4624 is a Windows logon. Type 10 indicates remote interactive. Um, one thing to keep in mind that a lot of people don't consider is that there's Windows audit requirements that need to be enabled so that you can even log these events. So you see log on, log off, um, and you want to go to, you want to be logging successful logons, and that'll generate those events. These events will occur on the log sources that you're getting. So that's something else to keep in mind. And here's just kind of an example of the local policy editor. So this is where uh, you, you change these. So um, in the advanced audit policy configuration, Windows 2008 and above has a pretty granular ability to, to log different items. So we're going to talk about validation. This is probably where most of the work goes in when you're doing baselining. So during this phase, um, you know, event sources are validated. You want to make sure that the events are coming in, that you're receiving them and in a simple use case. Um, and common problems will include like non-uniform audit policies. So for example, you might have audit settings on one domain controller that have been applied locally, but not across all your domain controllers. So on one, you might be getting log on success, and on another, you may not. So having a, uh, a very um, uniform uh, policy is very important. Um, incorrect audit policies. So you may have the same audit policy across your environment. They're just not set to collect the, inv the information that you need. Uh, configuration issues, so that might be um, 
agent installation, credentials that need to pull the logs, um, and then logging infrastructure. So do you have, if you send all your data through syslog, but the firewall blocks syslog, then you're obviously not going to get the data. Maybe you have syslog enabled everywhere except for your DMZ, and in that case, it's blocking the data. So that's something else to think about. Um, but in our case, the exploratory data analysis occurs in the validation phase. So determining whether the data is normally distributed, determining um, whether it's going to make a good uh, use case for and what our thresholds are going to be. So here, again, I've plotted RDP data on a, uh, for a 30-day period um, per day. So per day we see on day 20, we see uh, almost exactly on the average, and so on. Um, again, this data does not look heavily skewed. So you see kind of the same data above and below the, uh, the, the average here. Um, you see most of the data lies in this band, and it kind of as you go out, you see less and less. So just off the top of my head, you see it looks pretty good. Um, but when you look at the data, 93% of the data is within two standard deviations, 70% is within one. So that closely approximates our uh, three sigma rule at 68, 95, 99.7. So to take a look at the histogram, the histogram looks pretty symmetrical about the mean. So there's uh, approximately the same amount of data above and below the average. Um, but again, it's hard to say, but I think this is a good candidate for that. And finally, the, the Shapiro-Wilkes test that we talked about again, I fed the RDP count per day. We see that the uh, p-value is 0.39, which is far above the 0.05 uh, value that kind of rejects the hypothesis that um, this was not taken from a normally distributed data set. So we're pretty good. We think that this is normally distributed and we can start creating some thresholds. So the point we create our thresholds in the logic section. So we're gonna find the exact details used to generate the desired output. Um, so in the case of you know, clearing logs, it'd just be that event. In our case, it's uh, going above, the quantities are exceed or, or go below our thresholds. So for this, we're gonna use two standard deviations. So 95% of the time, the data should be well within that range and 5% will get an alert or some sort of alarm. Um, so the actual logic will be, we're gonna compare the current value for yesterday to the baseline that was generated from 30 days prior to that. And if that's above or below the data, we're gonna send an alert, essentially. Um, Question. Yep. Would you wanna pick 28 days so you have the same day of the week? Well, they're all, they're all weekdays, so I'm not, yeah, I'm not worried about it. Again, this is only weekday data. We're baselining, in our use case, we're baselining weekday data. So that's a good, no, that's a good thought because if it included weekends or significant changes or if the data changes on a day to day, maybe Wednesdays are always big, Mondays are always low and Fridays are always low, it may not be a good uh, uh, choice to, to baseline all weekday activity. So we're gonna talk about the implementation and testing. Um, this is where you test, you actually implement the use case, you create the uh, thresholds needed, um, and you, you define the output. Um, the outputs can really be an email. You're probably all familiar with email alerts, reports. It could be a dashboard event. Maybe you have a running tally on your dashboard. Um, could be just a new generated security event to be used with another rule. So maybe you have rules in place for, you know, if, if uh, so much weird activity happens for a specific user, we're going to trip a, a, a bigger offense. So, um, and there's probably others that I'm not thinking of, but um, I think you get the idea there. And finally, defining a response. This is a big issue, right? Like, what do you do with the alerts? So during the use case uh, development, you need to figure out what are you going to do with this? So create a formal response procedure. Um, you know, and this is good in a document. You know, companies always like documents and having a use case catalog really works well for uh, showing, you know, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, how you're managing that. And I've given that to auditors and it's worked very well for defining and proving that you're actually doing the work that you want. Um, so for RDP logon investigations, for me, I, I would have a list of questions I'd provide. I'm saying, you know, I'm gonna look to determine if the RDP logons appear to be a threat. That's what you're looking for. Is this an administrator or is this uh, somebody with compromised credentials moving laterally throughout your environment? Um, and you do that by, you know, are the logons at a night time for that user? So you see a user, you see like, uh, maybe it's the uh, network administrator or the network manager, and it's on a Sunday at 2 a.m. That may or may not be normal for your environment. So that's important to understand. Um, are there a large quantity of unique destinations? So are the user, is that, uh, you know, are you logging into one server repeatedly or all the servers in your environment? Should that user be logging into those servers? Are there single or multiple sources? Uh, how long were the sessions? Were they logging on looking for something then logging off or were they logging on and doing a variety of tasks? What processes were ran by the user? 
Um, were there single or multiple users? You know, was it one specific user? Or maybe there was 10 new admins hired and that just increased the threshold. Um, and finally, are there any, any major operational activities? So I would include these as part of my investigation for this specific use case. I think it's very important because, you know, uh, I think someone said earlier, you've got to ask yourself why we're doing this. You know, and you don't just do this for fun. Um, or maybe you are and you just want to put it on a, on a nice dashboard at the top of your uh, sock or something. But. And finally, the maintenance. Um, this is going to be a little bit more involved for baselines. Um, and, but the maintenance is really, uh, you know, every use case needs to be maintained. And I'll find that you know, organizations will have rules, but they don't know if they've ever triggered or whether they're triggering properly, or if they're correctly configured, if they're even applicable anymore. So this is where you kind of look at those questions. So yeah, just evaluate the use cases on, a schedule, on some sort of interval. So you know, every month, every quarter, semi-annually, annually, take a look and say, you know, is this still applicable? Do I still want to even use this? Do I still need baselines? Um, this is also where we identify and, outline, and handle kind of uh, outliers and just determine that in a baseline, is the data still normal? Like I'm showing 30 days, but in a period of 180 days, that may, that may change. It definitely will. So for this phase, we're gonna primarily focus on monitoring the health of our baselines. Um, and you do that by evaluating the data the same way that we did before. We're gonna take a look at a bigger swath of data and, and just see, is it still uh, normally distributed um, and is it still relevant? So here's a graph. Um, I talked, if you recall the p-values, the p-values, if it's over 0.05, we can say that it's probably normally distributed. So here's a graph every day um, that we generate a baseline over a period of about 101 days. So there's 101 baselines generated. We're graphing the p-value. So anything above this line is good. Anything below this line is bad. We see that there's 73% or 73 of them were, are uh, from good data sets, 28 are not. So there's a period here for about a month where the data starts to change and it doesn't look good for creating the baselines. When, when that happens, you're gonna start to get more alerts. And that's really the, the, the worst case scenario. You're gonna get more alerts than you, than you really should. You're gonna get more than that 95%. So here we see during this period, these baselines were not, were not, um, were not relevant. Here's the data that contributes to those baselines. To me, when I look at this, I see a, I see a clear breakout about this point. This point happens to be about 30 days. So now we start seeing um, out, what appear to be outliers at the time are actually normal. And what happens here is there was more RDP logons due to, uh, this could have been done due to uh, new admins. Um, maybe there's operational procedures that they had to do, like you had, there's a big patching push. Everybody had to log on and, and start patching the products. But what you notice here is that after a while, this data starts, it's still uh, up above, but this data becomes normal again and it's still relevant. So um, you, during this phase, you're gonna ask yourself, should we even still, can we even still create these baselines and are they working for us? In this case, it does uh, deviate, but it, it, it gets, um, and it comes back to, to life, I would say. So you would not, you'd still use this data and it's still relevant in my opinion. And you're really just gonna get more alerts during that period of time. So during the phase, you're gonna decide how to, handle, how to handle these data changes. In this case, I would leave the data. These are probably naturally occurring. Um, I did not investigate, so really the first step would be investigate and, and ensure that these are naturally occurring and not somebody that's been, not a compromised credential that's been in your network for, uh, it could have been a, you know, an attacker there for, for a month and they finally uh, patch all their systems. Um, but in this situation, it's a clear breakout, so I'm not, I'm not worried about it. But you have a couple options. Accept the deviations and wait till it recovers. Remove those outliers or scrap the use case in general. If it becomes too chaotic, you're not going to be doing yourself any favors by investigating alerts uh, you know, every day that you know, are just wild goose chases. Uh, so we're kind of wrapping up here. And uh, summary is pretty straightforward. You know? Identify the data. Make sure it's normally distributed. And you can use two standard deviations as the baseline. Um, you know, the use case, the, gen, the high level use case for this regular outlier detection, which is what we went over. So if you're SIM, you, you're managing these thresholds, that kind of falls into that, uh, that category. Proactive investigation and hunting. So you get into a network for the first time and you're trying to see if there's funny activity going on that you can start using uh, thresholds to determine, hey, is this normal activity? And then just general environment exploration. So you're new to a company, you want to figure out what's normal on here, what, what can you create rules on, what makes sense and what doesn't. Um, so during this presentation, like I thought, at the start I thought it'd be very easy. And, I'm, and as I'm going through this, all this stuff, and I'm thinking, man, we could really 
push this. So uh, I mentioned a breakout detection, or I mentioned a breakout. Well, there's a Twitter uh, uh, GitHub uh, package for breakout, automatically determining breakout detection statistically. So you can see that there was a breakout and handle that accordingly. Um, automatic outlier detection. So there are some uh, strategies for determining outlier detection, but nothing, uh, no specific guidelines. But maybe coming up with uh, automated outlier detection and, um, and a way to accept or reject those outliers. And then non-parametric analysis. So if your data, like a stock market, will trend up, but it'll deviate up and down, that will not follow normal distributions, but there's still ways to analyze that. Um, and you can use a package like the Twitter anomaly detection. Uh, for my intervals, I use 30 days. Um, you might be able to find better uh, intervals for that. And really, with the goal of determining or having the least amount of outliers and alerts while still remaining statistically relevant. Um, and then additional use cases I'd like to go through. So I covered two. They're pretty basic, but there's probably some really cool ones that can be applied. So I'm going to be exploring that. And then um, and then finally, kind of looking at multiple baselines. So if you create, if you have you know, 10 baselines that apply to each user and you're mapping their activity, you could create a sort of um, a weighted system and determine which user is showing the most anomalous activity and then investigating that, that user. So, you know, one user might often trip one baseline, but if they do nine, you know, that's, that's something significant. You need to look into that. So kind of investigating how we can uh, stack those baselines to um, really look for uh, global anomalies for, for specific users. Here's some references. So I, like I said, I really like the uh, logging log management book. Um, you know, if you're really interested more in the Shapiro-Wilkes test, uh, I definitely recommend InfoSec Nirvana for the sim use case. It's high level, pretty straightforward. You know, there's nothing uh, uh, difficult there. And if you're interested in the anomaly detection and breakout detection, these are easy packages. You're just feeding it a list of, uh, of quantities, and it'll, it'll graph that for you. Um, and then threadhunting.net if you want to take a look at additional use cases for um, evaluating outlier and baseline detection. And that's about it. Do we have any questions? Hi, right, thanks. Good talk. Um, I'm going to ask maybe the most obvious question. Uh, what if it's not normally distributed? What if it's like a fat tail or something like that? Exactly. So that's where, like I said, this will only work on normally distributed data. And, and you can take a look at a package like anomaly detection. You have to look at other, other methods. And that's something I have not explored. And there's a lot of data like that. For example, during the investigation, I took a look at account lockouts. Um, and in many organizations, account lockouts won't happen at all. So your, your, your most frequent event is going to be at zero, and you're going to only see a tail that'll, that'll, rot, that'll go down. And that's not, that's not a normally distributed data set, so you'd have to look at that in a different way. So depending on how that is, you could only have an upper limit um, or take a look at some other uh, methods. So I haven't gotten into that, but something I'm definitely going to explore uh, further. You talked about having a petabyte of data. I don't know how big your user base is, but what are you doing for audit log reduction? For log reduction? Yeah. Compression? No, I don't know. No, 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 no. I mean, no, I mean it's like filtering out the data you're Yeah, ready. no. Um, you know, so we're kind of getting into to my daily work. But you know what you, for most sims, you have 11 to 40 terabytes of data, and that's compressed after some sort of uh, interval. So for most comp organizations use cases from a smaller medium size, uh, 40 terabytes will store a significant quantity of data, more than they ever really need. So I'm not, I'm not usually worried about reduction. Um, but if you're looking at log reduction, things like looking at your audit settings, following CIS uh, benchmarks, right? they say, here's how your audit configuration should be. And you can start tuning those to uh, turn off stuff that you're not using. There's also different methods. So they call it output-driven logging. So if you have a list of use cases, what events are gonna, do you need? And only logging those events. Um, but then if you need that for forensic investigation, you may need additional events that are not part of that. So um, there's multiple techniques. It's not something I typically worry about because I haven't had to. Storage is, is you know, far more than, than I need, you know, usually, so. Um, instead of drawing sort of like a mean yeah. on a graph that involves both the weekends and weekdays or other sorts of like predictable anomalies, I guess, like that? Yeah. Do you think it makes more sense to be separating them out and then only evaluating the data, for example, on weekends, on a weekend-only graph, et cetera, so that you don't have to be constantly looking and then maybe you miss a dot that looks like it's a weekend dot or things like that? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I think we're covering, so you're talking about like uh, going back to the, one of the very earlier slides. This one. Um, so like this one you're kind of talking about, I think. And I didn't really know that these were weekends at first. That was just the first thing I thought. So you kind of determine that uh, through the exploratory analysis. And you know, in some instances, it may not change from uh, weekend to weekday. So you, got, you need to figure it out. But once um, this data right here, let's cover it. This data only contains weekdays. So I kind of do spread it out. And I just don't go into the baseline for a weekend, but you do the same exact process. So just for brevity. Yes? Really quick, is that all Windows events or just the um, 4624? These are, in this case, it's all Windows events. In my other graph, it's only the RDP logons. So if you see, this is really uh, 12.5 million, um, which actually isn't that much, but it's pretty stable there. Yep. Uh, this is more of a comment than anything else. If you, uh, if you start looking at uh, autoregressive and moving average models, mm -hmm. then you'll be able to actually incorporate those weekends into the, uh, into the baseline that you use. Because you'd be, so that's a yeah. good point. That's, and that's something that I'd definitely like to talk about anybody if they got some ideas on these, because this might be rudimentary and there might be some better options. So I think like looking at a seven day moving window kind of thing, is that what you're talking about? Well, uh, autoregressive models essentially, they, they take each, so if you do a seven day thing like that, it yeah. will normalize it for, the, for that seventh day. Okay. Um, or seven days back or, or so. And it'll help remove some of the seasonality. Oh, that's data. that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. And if you look at the Twitter packages, uh, seasonality is a big one with these because depending on your environment, it could change from season to season. Um, I think the Twitter package uses the ESD algorithm for its, um, which accounts for seasonality and things like that. So, I'll definitely look into that. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell me a story. Uh, on so you showed basically looking at two styles of events here, the yeah. Windows event and the RDP. Did your looking at that data when you initially set that up, did you find incidents to investigate further um, with those no. looks, or did you have to then use those same? Well, kind of. So I was unsure about that Friday with the dip, right? So that's one thing I did check out. And this one as well, right? So I looked into that, and the audit settings were changed between this day and that day. So that's something that I could tell. Um, we, we do uh, take a look at account lockouts. So I've seen in my past like uh, companies that allow RDP externally. They didn't put, they didn't put a uh, host behind the firewall. All of a sudden, accounts were getting locked out left and right. And surges in the account lockouts indicated that. And when they went and investigated it, it determined that, that the appropriate uh, you know, preventative controls were not in place. So um, that's another story. There's, yeah, there's plenty of stories. So in my past life, um, monitoring... So I used to look, but I'd only look at surges within the time series graph. I was not analyzing it like this. But I would see uh, severe spikes, and then the EPS would baseline. It would just, you know, uh, just stop, and then it would start falling behind. And uh, logging configurations on, an, on the Cisco IDS modules for a client I used to have at my old organization um, was incorrectly configured and was trying to pull down patches. And during that, was constantly generating DNS requests and um, in a highly secure network. And that actually led to cameras being taken offline. So determining that, we nailed down the process, we're able to fix it, and we kind of used trend analysis for that. It would be better if we could have more quickly determined that and had a, and had a, a use case developed around something like that um, to quickly determine those thresholds. So, yes. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you.